you've got to make it okay for teams not to get it right the first time. You've got to celebrate that. You've got to say, great job, let's have a failure party. Hello, listener. Tech Innovation Talks is back, bringing you sharp content on the most pressing tech and innovation conversation. This week's topic of focus brings us face to face with what we at MJD consider some of the core principles of design and innovation. We are delving into design thinking and a few of the surrounding innovation related issues. Now, here we usually like to bring in guests with particular backgrounds, as was the case with our episodes on food tech and banking. But excitingly, today's episode is a bit different. Today, we have a guest who has a bit of everything in his CV when it comes to innovation, design, and digital transformation. So without further ado, a warm welcome to Jalapsis Product Innovation Officer and Stanford adjacent faculty coach and advisor, Scott Sanchez. Hi, Scott. First up, great to have you here on Tech Innovation Talks. Can you first give our wonderful listeners a bit more details on your background? I'm thinking most specifically about your work at Stanford. And can you also share with us some of the projects that you are focused on at Jalax. Yeah, happy to. So first of all, thank you so much. Thrilled to be here. Excited to talk to you guys and have a good conversation on things. Uh, just a little about my background. Um, I started out as a technology person. That's what I thought I was going to be. I was an electrical engineer in college. So that's what I thought my life was going to be. Uh, and then I was uh, spending a summer, some summers at at t Bell Labs. And this guy walked in who was wearing a white, wasn't wearing a white coat. I was my, me and my engineering pals were all wearing white coats. And he asked me, that's great, Scott, about the technology you were just working on, but how do you build a business around that? And I looked at him with this deer in headlights look and said, oh my gosh, you, you can have the best technology in the world, but if you don't know how to build a business, you fail. So I was like, I'm gonna go be a business technology person. I went and got, uh, did management consulting for a number of years, went to business school, thought I was gonna be this business technology person. And then I read this case study about uh, this company that followed people home from the computer store and watched them install their personal financial software. This was back when we had computer stores. Uh, the company was into it. Uh, the product was Quicken. And I realized in that moment that you can have the best technology and the best business in the world. But if you don't really understand your customers, you fail. So I moved out to Silicon Valley. I spent eight years in product management at Intuit. It was wonderful. I learned a ton. Uh, I left uh, Intuit to drive innovation at Visa for a couple years. That's where I got connected to the D school at Stanford. Uh, and I learned that what I had done at Intuit, what they called customer driven innovation, was what the design school at, at Stanford called design thinking. And they realized I knew what I was talking about. Long story short, they invi invited me to join the faculty. So I still teach uh, three or four times a year out there. Uh, in fact, going out there in a few months, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and uh, then I took my uh, skills, if you will, uh, back to Atlanta, which is where I grew up. And I ran innovation at First Data, large payments company, ran innovation at Nationwide, large insurance company. And now at Deluxe, which is, uh, we think of ourselves as the oldest FinTech company. Uh, we invented the personalized checkbook in 1915. Uh, and now we're transforming the company into one that does digital payments. Uh, it does payroll and merchant services for small businesses receivables and payables off, uh, 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 offerings for mid to large businesses with financial institutions. And it's just been a ton of fun without a doubt. I wish I could tell you I knew what my career was going to be. So it's easy in hindsight to think about it, but uh, it's been a ton of fun so far. Sounds like you kind of just kind of went with the flow along the way. Interesting. Uh, joining Scott today, completing this headline grabbing panel and breaking a tech innovation record as the first guest, guest to return and to get that second invite is MJV CEO Mauricio Viana. Good morning, Mauricio. How are you today? And how does it feel to be the first guest to return? And what are you looking forward to sharing with our audience with regards to design thinking today? Um, thank you, Paul. Um, it's always a pleasure to participate uh, in this show. And me too, Scott. I'm also an engineer that, uh, that was uh, switched into uh, design thinking. And once you, you have this, uh, you know, once you start looking at the world with the with the goggles of a, of a designer everything changes and it's amazing because you, you start looking at um, some of the challenges that some products um, have but also you see a lot of opportunities you, see, you you know it's just walking by the beach and looking at someone helping 
um, you know, to, to block someone who's mashing, you know, in a volleyball uh, game uh, and just using a, a chair to block it. And then you say, oh my gosh, this could become a new product, a blocker for volleyball players. But anyway, uh, design thinking has this power of transforming companies. So I guess uh, a, a long answer to your question, Paul, design thinking is definitely a powerful tool to transform companies. Excellent. So let's get going with some design thinking discussion. Here on Tech Innovation Talks, we like to keep things as relevant as possible. And design thinking, I think we can all agree, is not a new concept. So Scott, starting with you, um, with regards to the evolution of DT, how has this concept stayed relevant? I'm thinking with regards to the movement of digital transformation. How can we still say that design thinking is relevant today? Yeah, it's fascinating to me. You know, it, d design thinking has its roots in product design, like hard, hard product design, like the mouse. Uh, the, the founders of IDEO, world-class consulting firm who designed the first mouse, uh, and uh, many other things, the hinge on a laptop, et cetera, they realized that they were following a, as Mauricio said, a design process, right? Thinking like a designer, trying things, understanding things, watching people. And they realized that they could actually turn that from just a product design capability to something more. Uh, funnily enough, the founders of IDEO founded the D School at Stanford. Uh, and so we, I, get, I get to benefit from all of that. But then they started to say, we can apply this to other things. We can apply it to real products. We can apply it to um, digital products. We can apply it to experiences. And so then I think where it really took off is the world of digital. Uh, as Mauricio said, there are all kinds of products out there. Some are great, some are terrible, but how do you, how do you figure out the difference between the two, right? How do you figure, and how do you actually design the ones that are more intuitive that you're just like, gosh, this just works. It works the way I think it should work without me having to learn it. And that's, I think, is often the power of design thinking and applying that. But it basically has some of the same building blocks that they used to apply to the hardware things uh, originally. Continuing the theme of transformation and change, how can design thinking be used to bring about cultural change? I believe a lot of the time when we think of DT, we imagine products and projects, but can it really have an impact on a company's overall culture, would you say? I think it can. And, and look, I think that culture change at an organization or a company is super hard, right? It's really, really challenging and everybody wants to do it. What I've found as an interesting byproduct of design thinking is that some of these things that we teach people how to do to create these new products actually help drive culture change. So I'm not one who believes you can directly change the culture. I'm one who believes you do things that are in the direction of where you want to go and the culture evolves over time. And that's where I think design thinking can can help. When I think about culture change using elements of design thinking, I think about three things. Number one, I think about inputs. You've got to train people. You've got to teach people how to think like a designer. You've got to teach people how to do this and apply it to their day job. Innovation can't be one of these things that just happens in the nighttime or a special skunk works team and a, you know, out in Silicon Valley outpost or something like that. You've got to help them understand what it is so they can apply it to their job. Number one. Number two, You've got to connect it to the processes of the organization, performance management, uh, rewards and incentives, those types of things. Because if, if what you do is you keep innovation to the side or design thinking to the side, it'll never go mainstream. But then third, and perhaps the most important thing, and this is where I get really excited about design thinking, design thinking is all about bringing the story of a human to life, whether it's the volleyball player that Mauricio was talking about or other people you see, and so that third element of culture change for me is what I call reinforcers. You've got to tell these stories and these stories have to persist inside the company and outside the company. And if you do all of these things well in transforming the products, one of the most amazing things is employees are more engaged, which actually ends up driving the culture. And so I'm a big fan of that. It was a little unexpected for me. And so when I go into organizations, I get asked to help on the product side but then a wonderful byproduct is the culture starts to evolve towards a more customer-centered or human-centered way of thinking as well. Excellent. Mauricio, do you have anything to add on that? Maybe you can talk a little bit about the storytelling that Scott's talking about here. I would just add um, that at MJV, we have uh, our, you know, our approach to, to cultural transformation, which starts by defining a vision. So uh, design thinking has... Uh, excellent tools to, to, 
like Scott mentioned, to engage um, employees, the upper management. Um, so we have uh, multiple ways to, to create uh, very engaging workshops where we, we end up with a vision for the organization. So that's the first step. So once we have the vision, then we start um, identifying pillars to, you know, that supports this vision and how are we going to communicate this vision towards the, the whole uh, organization. And, and then this is, this is done, um, you know, like one day one of our clients um, woke up completely branded, you know, with, uh, and, and, and specifically um, branded in, in, in the wrong way. And, and so employees were, were asking, what is this going, what is going on? Why, why is our brand changed? And, and then there were some games that we developed to help them um, answer questions. And then this was actually a way to bring awareness of the importance of, you know, each one of the marketeers team using the brand in the right way. So that, that element of creativity to bringing uh, and uh, bringing elements to life and communicating in a more tangible way is the is the next step. And then, lastly, tools. You know that uh, we develop. We, we we are in this sense we are different than than other design firms, pure design firms, because at MJV we we started as a technology company. So we we are an end to end company where we start with the concept, the strategy, the, the customer experience, and go all the way into implementation so we actually build tools that supports the you know the all, all this process of cultural transformation and we have been doing this throughout the the past maybe five years now in in large scale one of the things Mauricio, that you hit on that i think is just so interesting mm -hmm. um it's that concept of empathy or understanding people right and so i think to your point on cultural change understanding where people are internally understanding where the leaders are uh, trying to communicate to them in a way that will translate to something meaningful. That's just a huge skill of design thinking. And I think a huge part of, you know, people and cultural transformation and digital transformation for that. I think that's awesome. Well, funny that you should mention leaders because my next question moves us on to leadership. So essentially there's no cultural change without the people at the top making, following those rules. Scott, how can leadership facilitate the success of DT? Essentially, how can they inspire people to bring the best out of them? Yeah, they can stop doing what they're doing. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's really interesting, right, when we think about this. And I think that I'm sure Mauricio would agree, if you're really trying to change a new, to create a new product or change a culture, every level of the organization has to be involved to some degree. And um, I find that some of the biggest challenges are with leaders. And my hypothesis is this, leaders have been right most of the time in their careers. That's how they've gotten uh, higher and higher. And, um, and that's great from one perspective, but when you're in the innovation space and the design thinking space, you, you come to realize pretty quickly that you don't know the answers anymore. Like you, you barely know the questions and you're starting that out. And so there are a couple of pieces of advice I often give to leaders. You know, number one is pretty basic and it starts similar to Mauricio with uh, define the vision. If you're gonna really sort of make progress, You've got to align your innovation efforts and your new product efforts with the vision for the company. That's an easy one. People are like, yeah, yeah, I got that. The two that are less obvious. Um, one is what I often tell leaders is you've got to going from being self-centered to customer centered. And they're like, I'm not self-centered. Don't, don't call me self-centered. But what I mean by that is you've been right most of your life. You think you've got the answer. Well, in innovation and design thinking, you don't have the answer. And the sooner we realize that, and the sooner we flip our perspective to that end user or that end customer, the better off we are. So I often tell leaders that what I need you to do initially is not say yes or no. I often need you to, I, we call it boomerang. I need you to answer your team's questions with questions. If they say, well, what do you think? You say, well, what do you think? And so that boomerang back to put the power and the expertise back into the team's hands that's closest to the customer, I think is really key, right? So that, you know, moving from self-centered to being customer-centered is a hard transformation. You know, many leaders would say, well, I am customer-centered. I think like a customer, I am a customer. That's not customer-centered. Customer-centered is you go from eyes and me's to Sarah's and John's and the people you talk to. And then the third thing I often tell them is you've got to make it okay 
for teams not to get it right the first time. You've got to celebrate that. You've got to say, great job. Let's have a failure party that that didn't work, right? How do we celebrate that? That is a really hard thing, especially most leaders or operators. They sort of have this linear model. You do this and you get this return. You do this, this return. Innovation is much more exponential, if you will. And so you've got to make it okay for the team to realize that they can learn things that are against what they thought, but the goal is the learning and the iteration from that. And if you give them the time and the resources, they're going to end up figuring it out because that's what we're trying to do as we sort of create new products for people. I always think, Scott, that it, there's always a fine balance there with regards to kind of giving that feedback and saying, oh, great, unfortunately, this isn't the right thing, but we're moving on. We can try something new without kind of patronizing. And, and it's a real balance with regards to that. Mauricio, is there anything you wanted to add on leadership? I, I mean, I... I wish uh, all leaders would um, put in designers in each section of the of the company. This would definitely transform their company. And we see, you know, SAP results of you know, most of the companies that value design that has a design driven strategy. They are successful. Um, so yes, that's um, definitely one one of. Uh, it's a, it's a very important recommendation. You know, bring in design to your corporation. Okay, so let's start to break down design thinking a little bit now. Uh, within the model at MJV, we have a five principles and five stages, which are immersion, analysis, ideation or brainstorming, prototyping, and implementation. When you're teaching the subject of design thinking, Scott, to your lucky students at Stanford, uh, which of the phases do you emphasize as having the biggest impact if there is one on success? And maybe after that, both of you can start to kind of look at the different phases and maybe give us a couple of cheeky tips on, on where you can kind of get little bits of magic out of the areas. Can I start with you, Scott? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. You, you talked at the beginning about uh, design thinking being relevant. Um, design thinking is not new. Uh, the, the, the jargon uh, has taken off. And I feel like if I Google design thinking 15 years ago, there would be like five sites. And now it's like billions of sites and whatnot. I think the challenge is, um, the good news is lots more people are talking about it and using it. The challenge is they're losing some of the elements of it. So one of the things I try to enforce, whether it's five steps or four steps or seven steps, is that in my mind, there are three basic building blocks that if you're not doing these three building blocks in whatever steps you do, um, it's not really design thinking. And those three building blocks are collaborative. This is a team sport, right? Three to five people, five to seven people, whatever it is, a small team working together, you can't do it alone. Number two, you use empathy or the understanding of people to identify needs, right? And so those are the tools you use. There are lots of different techniques for empathy, which I'm sure we can get into some of those. But you use empathy to uncover needs. Sometimes they are expressed needs and sometimes they're unexpressed or latent needs. And then third, you're using prototyping, build it before you build it, to try to bring your ideas to life. That often starts at low fidelity of, you know, hand drawings of screens or construction paper and popsicle sticks and whatnot. But you're using prototypes to try these things. I've seen a lot of organizations, they're like, we're doing design thinking. We're doing a workshop tomorrow on prototyping. And that's design thinking. No, not really. Right? You've got to have all three elements of that. So regardless of what the steps are, those for me are the three building blocks. So when I teach students at, at Design Thinking, you're going to have to make up the right steps for you. Stanford teaches it also in a five-step process. A little bit different steps, but in essence, the same thing. Right? Empathy, define, ideate, prototype, test. Right? But the reality is you've got to define what it is for you because the magic is not the words. The magic is how you use these tools and these mindsets to actually identify and solve a problem, which is really all that design thinking is in a nutshell. One of the um, phases that to me is, 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 is actually fantastic. And, and I think uh, uh, maybe <clears throat> companies or consulting companies should charge more for that, or even uh, employees, internal employees should receive a raise for doing it. Um, it's the reframing aspect. Mm -hmm. So many times we see customers um, just uh, having their mindset already fixed about uh, how to solve a problem, really defining what the problem is. But then once you dive into, you know, the people, the, the context of the 
of the the real challenge then you identify that uh, that problem is not actually the one that needs to be solved and eventually you can solve that same problem by by tackling another one so just for instance um you know we we had a like a big bank um very very worried uh, about why you know customers from from lower class were were not uh actually using you know their financial products and and all that and so so the the problem actually to be solved was how do they view money you know how how money is viewed for these uh for these lower class uh people and and uh there were cases where you know once uh once visiting their houses like the empathy uh, piece that scott was was saying we found some some credit cards frozen inside the fridge <laughs> so that's that's how serious these people take you know in, in terms of savings you know to avoid spending money so these are some elements that gives us insights in 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 how to better serve these clients you know um but uh yeah that's so the reframing to me uh which is usually during the analysis and, and synthesis phase I'll build on that. I, I agree without a doubt. I'll tell you a quick story as well. Um, and and uh, Paul, you talked about the, it's a delicate balance of how you communicate to leaders. When I was at First Data, our chief product officer came to me and said, I want you to go build me a mobile wallet. This was about seven years ago, uh, a mobile wallet, right? I want you to, uh, I want this, right? These phone things to be able to pay at a restaurant or a retail or a quick service restaurant and things like that. And so my team went out and we did immersion right, without a doubt. And we did the empathy. And uh, one of the areas we focused on is quick service restaurants uh, and specifically the drive through. Uh, and so uh, if you've ever ridden in the back of an SUV with a mom and a couple kids, uh, it is not a pleasant experience. It is brutal. It is. Um, and so if you're going through the drive through, uh, we were thinking, all right, great. You can have your phone. You can order. You know, you can do all these things. Maybe you tap your phone at the drive through window and all of those things. But when we rode in the back of those SUVs, we realized how crazy it is, right? How frantic it is, how challenging it is to manage all of that. And so my pr chief product officer said, the problem we have to solve is payment. Talk about reframing, uh, Mauricio. Um, and that's what we thought we were solving. And we, we worked with some large companies who came to us and said, we want you to build us a mobile wallet. And everybody thought the problem was payment. But after riding in the back of those SUVs, realizing how hard it was to do the order and to collect the order, realizing the waiting going around the drive through was challenging, we actually reframed the problem. The problem wasn't payment. The problem was waiting in line. So how might we reinvent waiting in line? And so you can imagine going back to the chief product officer and saying, you're wrong, right? This is the bigger problem. But we did and we had to convince him we brought him along i brought him out and i made him sit in those suvs as well and he was a changed person and so i was the messenger sort of delivering that long story short how do you solve waiting in line well what we came up with was a mobile app that you could order ahead integrated to the point of sale right it goes over the over the internet it goes to the kitchen when you geofence in right in the area right around you it'll send that order to the kitchen to make it because you don't want to make it too soon. And then it'll trigger them uh, to walk outside because you've parked in a curb, uh, a curbside space that you put the number on it, right? So we piloted that and ignited that with Chick-fil-A uh, here in Atlanta. And it's gone crazy. We had Olive Garden and Burger King and Taco Bell and a bunch of others doing that. But it all came back to that reframe from solving the problem of payment to solving the problem of waiting in line. By the way, to Mauricio, to your point, the problem of payment is solved in that, but it's not exactly. an explicit step, right? But it was solved in that. And so that came out of my team in first data. So I'll build on Marisa, the reframe, you gotta get out of your office. You gotta see people for real. That's the empathy. You gotta see the bowl in the, fr in the freezer frozen with the credit cards in it to make, to realize it. you gotta get in the SUV to see it. That empathy is big. A lot of people sort of equate design thinking with prototype. Oh, I'll build a prototype. Great. And I'll get it in people's hands. And that's where Lean Startup, which there are elements of Lean Startup I love, right? That's one of the challenges though, is Lean Startup is all getting into users' hands live as fast as you can. I actually love to prototype early, but if you don't pair it with the empathy and the understanding and the reframing, you might just end up with a better mousetrap 
and your goal is not to solve, not to, not to catch a mouse. I wonder how hard it was for you to get your boss in the back of that, that car back in the day. Uh, I, I made a challenge to him. I said, you won't do it. You won't do it. You won't do it. And guess what? He did it. So uh, I won't say there was empathy for him, but I was trying to use his, uh, his uh, strengths uh, in a way that I could get him into that SUV. But what he had to admit, right, getting him to the SUV was hard. Getting him to admit that the problem he thought, the thing he wanted, wasn't the right thing. That took some convincing and some time without a doubt. But once we got there, he was like, oh, I'd rather solve the bigger problem. And we helped turn first data from a payments company to a commerce company with some of the work we did around that, which we thought was the more important opportunity to go after. Some good old fashioned reverse psychology there. So let's switch things up a little bit here. So we've taken a glance at design thinking, but another area that I know your team is kind of pushing the boat on, Scott, is banking products, specifically end-to-end -end payment platforms. Yeah. Today, I can imagine there must be hundreds of options out there. Uh, perhaps you know you could share with our listeners some of the things that they should take into consideration when shopping in that, around. Like, you know, um, what? How can you ensure that the solutions are high-end, quality user experience solutions? Yeah, it's a great question. It's funny. Um, uh, banking, in some sense, was a um, slow viewed as a slow industry, but the amount of innovation going on in banking and payments is crazy. And there, there B two C platforms, there B two B platforms, there B two B two C platforms, and all of those things. Um, we've applied design thinking over this, and I, I never considered myself a fintech person. But if you look at the companies I've worked with, Intuit and Visa and First Data, and maybe Nationwide, and especially now Deluxe. Um, I've been using design thinking elements of it to understand what really matters throughout this. Um, and so um, what we've learned is a couple things, right, if you will. One is no doubt as you move money around, the frictionlessness or getting friction out of that uh, is huge, right? Take checks as an example. People have been saying checks are dead for years and years and years. Funnily enough, remote deposit capture, which allows you to take a picture of your check, right, actually gave checks another couple decades of life because it, it removed friction. You no longer have to go to the ATM and write on the back and sign it. You can do it on your mobile phone. And so friction is a big thing that we think about. How do we get friction out of it? But the other thing I would say about these, these platforms that move money is as much as they move money, what I think a lot of people forget is they also move information or need to move information. This is especially true with larger businesses. Getting the money between two entities is great, but understanding what that money is for is actually almost even more important. And so what we try to think about a lot is how do we move money and data together or put it back together at the end? Because knowing that you got $1,000 from a customer is important. It, getting the $1,000 from a customer is important. Knowing that it was customer account number one, two, three, four, and it was an overdue bill. If you're the receivables department in that company, that's even more important because they are spending tons of energy, tons of effort, tons of friction uh, to actually match those things up along the way. So one of the things we think about a lot is how can we not just, uh, how can we take the friction out of the movement of money, but how do we increase the intelligence or the smarts around this? And so one of the things we think about a lot is a, another concept called jobs to be done. If you've heard of customer jobs to be done, what's the problem you're really solving? Um, we've learned in these payments uh, uh, networks, there are two jobs to solve. One is to move the money. The second is to apply the money to the right place on both ends. And sometimes there's a bank in the middle as well there. And so those are some of the things we think about sort of to use Mauricio's comments. We're thinking end to end as we think about all of those things. Um, and so that's probably the second thing I would say about these. And then the third, and everybody talks about this is what form, what form are you going to use? What form is it going to be? Uh, is it going to be a check? Is it going to be cash? Is it going to be digital, ACH? Is it going to be cryptocurrency? Is it going to be connected to the blockchain? I'm not one who believes there's going to be one form to rule them all. Quite frankly, we as a payments company have got to enable all of them, right? And, and as we enable all of them, we also have to make sure each person, the payer and the payee, can get the benefits they want. Imagine if we could disconnect how the payer pays with how the payee receives, so you could pay it via crypto and it would come into your account via an ACH or something like that. How do we actually provide that flexibility? So those are some of the things we think about a lot 
removing friction, making it smarter, um, and, um, and making it more flexible so that we could do that. It's a fascinating world out there. There are tons of startups, there are tons of big companies doing it, and we've got to all work together across all of that to make it as seamless as we can for those customers. So Scott, I'm a, an Englishman, and I grew up watching some of the James Bond films, and I always used to love those moments where they used to show us all the gadgets and the exciting new technology which James was going to get to use. I, I'd be admiss not to take this opportunity to ask you about some of the exciting frictionless technology that might be coming our way soon. Maybe even you could share it, take us into those brainstorming rooms where you, some of the ideas that you've heard with regards to sort of payment facilities, and more importantly, how much of an impact will 5G have and how can you make sure it stays safe? Awesome. So you had a couple other things that I think are huge. Let me start from the back first. Safe, security. Um, I, I, um, it's a really interesting challenge um, because what we're finding is that because ease of use and frictionless is so important, people generally are wanting to do less and less to keep things safe, but they expect things to be kept safe. Right. And so it really creates a challenging bar for the companies that are in that, because, look, we could lock down, uh, you know, every payment thing if everybody did 30 steps. Right. To protect the to protect that transaction. People aren't going to do 30 steps. Right. They're go they want to take a picture of the check and be done with it. They want to, you know, bump their phone with someone. And so it, it really puts an impetus on the companies behind it. To lock that uh, to lock that security in, and we're trying to do everything we can from you know traditional multi-factor authentications to new technologies that can catch fraud sooner, right? With the velocity of fraud as much as we can, we've got to increase security while not counting on the people involved to do as much work as they've got. And it's a huge bar, and so we're continuing to invest in the technologies and the people and the processes to make that happen. So that's I think one one big part of it, you know, in terms of uh, the James Bond, I was also a Jetsons fan, right? So I love the Jetsons cartoon and they could do all kinds of things. Um, I would say, I'll give you a couple examples of things I'm excited about, um, uh, sort of starting from nearer term and, and then longer term. Nearer term, you know, I talked about those accounts receivable groups. They spend all of their time, uh, not that you're an accounts receivable specialist or I am, but they spend a ton of time manually trying to connect things. They get on the phone with customers. Was this your check? What account number? They email other people in the company. They, they, we call them forensic investigators. They are phenomenal at tracking down a payment or an invoice or something like that. Um, what I'm excited about that we're working on, we're working on a platform to sit across the systems they use today and do so much of that automatically and then learn so it makes it easier. Hey, last time this matched with this account, does it match with this account again, right? And so we can actually free those people up to actually do things that are more value added to the company, like look at their receivables, look at how much they're paying in shipping or things like that. So I'm excited about that. That's gonna change their lives. Sort of one level out, I get excited about payroll, uh, believe it or not, uh, when small businesses. Uh, and uh, payroll is one of those things that is a nightmare to set up for small businesses. These small businesses are cupcake makers. They're not business people. How do you make it really easy so you can you can almost just set it up as a recurring transaction like we do with bill pay today? How do we do that? And so we have a new payroll product that we're continuing to evolve that hopefully will make that job easier so the people in those small businesses can get on to being the small business and not spending time on payroll. And then maybe the third thing I get excited about which is a little further out, is how do we make all this movement of money going around more seamless? Like, it's fascinating to me um, that we still have so much friction in payments. Like, in many ways, I feel like we've, we've, you know, you're a kid sliding down a slide. We want payments to go as fast as you can, but on the playground with five-year-olds, kids bunch up at the bottom of the slide and it backs everything up, right? I feel like that's where we are. And I still see a lot of friction. There are tons of checks written. There are tons of checks uh, being done. Setting up an ACH wire is not nearly as easy as bumping a phone, right? PayPal and Square and other and Venmo have made it easier and easier, but it still requires the payer to use Venmo and the receiver to use Venmo, right? What if we get into a world where, Paul, you can use Venmo because you have your money there or it's connected there. Mauricio can receive it via Square and then I can get paid via ACH because that's my preference, 
right now we have to subscribe to what the pay, how the payer wants to pay. And you have to have this conversation with your landscape person, with your house person. Uh, how do you take it? Can I pay you this way, et cetera? What if we could actually allow flexibility and choice for each of us to choose how we want to pay and get paid? And it doesn't matter how Paul chooses to pay and get paid, but we can still integrate together. Those are things I get excited about thinking about, of the benefits of each of those. Uh, the one thing that that's always caught my attention was that i was a victim of fraud in the 90s oh. when the technology was like so much more simple people would just kind of take a look at your card write down a few digits and before you knew it you know you you were a victim of fraud and it seems like as the technology has advanced maybe i'm naive in thinking but it does seem like it's a, a safer world am i right in thinking that way Mary? So well, i'm not sure about if it's a safer world now uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the access, the, the interconnectivity of, of all companies and everyone, I think it has made the world not as safe as it was before, uh, is, is the other way around. So I guess the, 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 most, uh, the most important thing you should use, first of all, you, you need to understand the, the prevention piece of it. You know, uh, many of the many of the frauds, they, they start within the company, you know, the, sometimes, um, employees that are, that are not happy or, or, or even, uh, employees that have not been, um, correctly guided, you know, on, on, on having like a clean table policy, for instance. Um, and then there's also the other side of, of the prevention where, um, you need, uh, systems that, uh, and, and actually, you know, help definitely for to, to monitor what's going on with your with your network um, one small tip that is so simple that not everyone does is to keep their anti antivirus uh, updated you know the the version also the version of your operating system updated you know if you look at so many people that uh, forget to do this and this is where you know hackers can can come in um, yeah that's uh, Sure. It seems like there's kind of simple measures, Scott, but things that people just aren't doing. They're kind of just trusting that, that, that everything will be all right, that we're kind of like in a, a stage where everything's just going to run smoothly. Is there a naivety there or has the technology got to a, a space where it is actually quite difficult for fraudsters to do their thing? Yeah. I mean, I would say two things. One, technology is getting better. And I'm glad it appears to you that uh, it's a safer world. Uh, um, but the reality is technology is advancing on both sides, both the companies that are trying to keep things secure and the, com and the people or companies or entities that are trying to break it, right? And so it's, it's, an, it's a journey. It's not a destination, right? And so we've got, we all as an ecosystem have got to keep going um, in that journey. And so, you know, it's this, it's this never ending battle that I think we'll continue to fight. That being said, I think Mauricio's point is a well is a good one, which is people do need to take some basic precautions. But I think we as technology providers have to make that easier and easier and easier. I'll give you the example: backing up your computer, right? You should back up your computer. Everybody knows you should back up your computer if you've ever lost data, right, from that. But people didn't for years, right? There were some of us who did. I consider myself one of those who's backed up my computer for decades. But most people didn't, and why not? Because it wasn't easy. Right. It wasn't simple. And we as much as people want security, they constantly vote for convenience. And so what I think we've got to do is we've got to find those ways to make things super, super easy. I set up my wife's computer, for example, with Google Drive backup. It just backs up to the cloud automatically and she never has to touch it. That is a much simpler solution than the old tape drives and things like that. And so I think the security bar gets higher. The convenience bar gets lower. Right. And we've got to participate in both of those things and find those opportunities where we can make it as simple as possible okay. so that they do some of the basics. We're going to have to still count on them, but our job is to keep making that easier and easier for them to do. Yeah. And, and, and that, and for that, uh, design thinking is a, an important tool, uh, Lately. Well, Paul, you know, ha helping to communicate all these different measures, um, to employees and to people, it's something, um, that design thinking can definitely help. Yeah, passing on the message, absolutely. Okay, let's switch things up now and look more at the details involved in customer-driven innovation. Mauricio, 
Product Service Systems, or PSS, is a term used to describe the processes involved in transforming a product business based business model into a product as a service ecosystem. What are your overall perceptions of PSS? And can you give our viewers an insight into why companies are investing in turning products into services? Well, first, first of all, products are, are um, becoming services um, can help the, the owner of the product to, to create a higher loyalty with their customers. So instead, instead of having just one transaction and that's it, that the product is installed in the premises uh, of the of the customer. Now, it needs to you know needs to to use it, you know, transforming it into a service. The customer now is constantly in touch with the with the service and with the owner of the product. So that's uh, that's one way of, of of looking at it. So increasing the loyalty. The second is is once you you do this, um, you can increase the, the amount of, of money you make. So um, now instead of having just one one invoice, now you have several smaller ones, but uh, but constantly you know happening, and and this is uh, and this is great business. I mean, so um, perpetuating the product, making it more relevant. Um, understanding also how how users are using your product and how relevant it is, um, so it gives you that chance of engaging with your customer more frequently, and then eventually evolving your product into other uh, you know new features that uh, can engage even more your customers. Scott, I I didn't come from a, a design background, and one of the things that always gets my attention is how many different names and kind of buzzwords come into play with design and at the beginning it was a bit daunting and I've worked in the company for a while now and I'm, I'm getting a hand on on a few of the different terms but talk to me about product discovery where does it differ from design thinking uh, how can it be used to make the the best possible products reach our our, our audiences yeah it's interesting um, the thing I think you're on which is a good one is language there are all these words out there, even the words design thinking, the word innovation, product discovery, what do all of these things mean? One of the things that I try to do as I started a company is let's just go on language. What's the word design mean? What's the word innovation mean? And I'll create a, a definition of it. So for example, at Deluxe, our definition of innovation is delight businesses in solving their needs so they thrive and succeed, right? So even getting people to align on that is big. Uh, without getting on a soapbox, I would argue getting clear on what words mean is important in other parts of life too. Uh, but if we stay in technology, um, you know, product discovery for me is almost synonymous with using design thinking to solve it. Um, all product discovery means to me is go out and find the problems to solve. And once you find the problems or the needs to solve, create a product or a service or a combination to solve those needs, right? And in that way, you're discovering uh, what you need to solve. But so many people focus on the solution. I'm discovering the product I need to go build. That's great. But what we find is that actually, if you spend more of your energy focusing on what problem or need do I need to solve, then you, you get less wed to what the product is and the product can evolve more naturally before you launch and then after you launch. And so for me, product discovery is all about going and finding the needs that are out there and figuring out how to solve those needs uh, that your customer has and sometimes even changing the customer. The one thing I would say that most, the other thing I would say is that most companies think about is they think about product discovery as a one and done. They do it at the beginning. They discover the product, they launch the product. I would argue that even after you launch, you should still be discovering what the product is, whether it's to Mauricio's point to find adjacent opportunities to capture more revenue or whether it's to evolve your product uh, as well. And you need to stay in lockstep with your customers and your prospects and potential customers to understand. And so for me, just like design thinking is a mindset and a, just a way of being that's hard to go back to, uh, back from, as Mauricio said, I think product discovery is an ongoing process to keep finding that value in those opportunities and keep trying to solve those needs. So that's probably what I would say about product discovery. It's a, again, it's a journey. It's not a one-time thing. It's something you got to keep doing if you want to keep solving the needs of your customers, which quite frankly is what I think many of us are in business to do.
Mm. Okay, and Mauricio, prototyping. So imagine that we've got our product from Scott. How do we best test it? When it comes to final testing, what are the, your preferred methods? How can we best validate a business idea, a value proposition, product, service, or feature? Talk a little bit about the merits of prototyping and having a minimum viable product. At MJV, we, we, um, we have several examples of, of prototyping and, and also building minimal viable products. They, they are used in different phases of a project or, or of a need. Um, so, you know, to, to Scott's point, um, you know, in terms of, of even for product discovery, you may be able to, to prototype, um, you know, a solution, create, create a tangible, um, tangible solution that can help understand and improve and, 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 and help you learn, you know, the, the, the challenge that you have, um, uh, so it's prototyping. It's user usually done in a smaller scale, you know, to solve smaller problems. Now, um, and I can give you an example here, um, very interesting one. Uh, we had one client uh, that was an insurance company that wanted to sell um, um, a very small insurance called like micro insurance to to you know inside inside a train station. Um, so this is like a, a, a well-defined problem, um, small problem, but it's not a product. It's not, you know, we, we don't have the full life cycle of the product, which in a minimal viable, you know, MVP, this is what happens. Uh, but let, let me just uh, finishing. Um, so the prototyping there, we, we, took, uh, we took this micro insurance um, and tried to sell it on the, on the line while, pe while people were waiting to pay for their tickets at their train, you know, inside the train station. And it didn't work. You know, prototyping is really testing, you know, the the idea. And then we try to go inside the cashier to to see whether people would buy the micro insurance there. And it didn't work. We went to the, you know, where people were sitting waiting for the train on the station, and it didn't work. And finally, when we were inside the train, while people were sitting down and uh, more relaxed. In one minute, we sold about 30, 30 tickets. So that's the you know the beauty of prototyping is really testing, helping, and, and in a very cheap way, by the way. Um, you know, low fidelity prototypes, and and of course you can increase the the fidelity of of your prototype into digital, something more sophisticated. But uh, so that's for prototype. Now for minimal viable products, we this is when you know, you have evolved your concept. Maybe you have proto created several smaller prototypes and now you say, well, okay, now I have this product and I want to test it with the market. You know, I have uh, already an idea, a good idea, uh, but before launching it, I want to test it with the market. And I don't want to build the full product just to see whether, you know, I will have traction, people will buy the product or not. So that's when an MVP comes into play. Um, and we have helped also, this is another area where we have, we have helped uh, companies with, uh, with one of our services called fly or die. So either the idea flies or it dies. So this is what the, the MVP is for, you know, to help to understand whether the idea will fly or it will die. Mauricio, as a CEO, when you put out MVPs, I can imagine sometimes it might be quite challenging from a perspective of, oh, this is my company, you know, we're putting out a product which if we put out another two weeks on it, maybe it would look a little bit glossier, it might look a little bit shinier. Is that something that you've had to kind of think about along the way and kind of get to a point where, no, it's okay, we're going to follow the model, we're going to follow the principles, and we'll get there in the end? I mean, there's always a point where you have to say enough, right? Otherwise, you're going to continue, continue, continue to do the, 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 AV, the, the MVP. Um, the interesting thing is, is not only understanding whether you have a market, but also whether the changes to, to the MVP are minimal. So if you, if you like, like Scott was, was giving the example of his uh, solution for for uh, the line, you know, payments in line. So if that worked for chicken, Chick-fil-A, but then when he went to, I don't know, McDonald's, 
he would have to completely change his his MVP, then it's hard. Then you don't really have a product. You know, you have a customized product for one another, then you don't really have a problem. So, so really understanding uh, whether your MVP works for a segment in, of market and this market is big enough for you to launch your product, that's, that's crucial uh, whenever moving forward with an MVP. The other thing I would add to that, um, a lot of organizations care about time to market, right? And there's a lot of focus on time to market, which as there should be. Some of the questions I get are, gosh, Scott, do we have time to do the empathy work? Because I got to get to market sooner. Gosh, Scott, do we have time to do the prototyping work? Can't we just go build it and whatnot? And, and what I try to reframe that, to use that word again, is do you want to get to market first or do you want to get to market with the right thing, the right enough thing? And so by actually doing the empathy and the prototyping, it can feel like it's a little slower. It's actually not. I've actually seen it speed up things in general, but it's different than what people expect. But those tools of empathy and prototyping and trying those things at not just Chick-fil-A, but at McDonald's and you know those other things, that will save you a lot later because it's much more expensive to change things later than it is earlier. So those are some of the conversations we have so that we can get those MVPs out uh, as fast as we can. And quite frankly, what leaders really want is they want the revenue that comes with it, right? And so by using these tools that we've been talking about, prototyping and whatnot, you can actually get to the revenue quicker because you're failing faster and you're learning quicker and you're changing much more frequently. And so that's some of the conversations we have to have to help them understand that this will look different, but that's important for it to, to do so. Okay, Scott, so this is a little bit of an outside of the box question, but it, it's maybe something that I think our audience would be very interested in. When we talk about branding, I think we all like to have our opinion, right? Oh, it should be red, it should be green, and we all kind of give our, no, I'm sure about this, but there must be data and science that goes into that. It's not just a, a shot in the dark or, or experience, or at least I hope it's that way. Can you talk us maybe a little bit, uh, take us behind the scenes of what you do at your company with regards to logos? Tell, tell us it's not just shots in the dark. People actually, they need to use science, right? Well, at the risk of saying it depends, uh, I think it depends. But what I would say is what, what I think, uh, what I think is most important with branding, and it's going to go back to what we've been talking about, quite frankly, it's understanding the customer or the prospect or who you're trying to message to. Uh, and so all these tools of design thinking that we've been talking about, I think have implications for not just product, but for branding, for operations, for sales, for all of these things along the way. And so for us, when we think about it, and we both use some of these tools of design thinking to inform our branding, we also have products that help other people, small businesses especially, build their brand, create their logo, et cetera. And what we talk to small businesses about all the time is who are your customers and what's the meaning that your company plays in their world? How do you think about that? Because really what the brand is just an outcome of what the business is. Um, and so the best brands that I've seen, the best logos that I've seen are tied up into the meaning and the role that the company plays based on those deep customer insights that they're trying to do. An example, we, we've, you know, many of us have seen these various examples. You know, if you look at the Amazon logo, right, it has an arrow that connects the A to the Z, meaning that they have everything, right? Now, as you know, Amazon started just selling books, right, without a doubt. But as they started to evolve from that, they started to change their logo. They wanted to be the one-stop shop for where everybody goes for everything from A to Z. And so that, that deep customer insight, which is make it really easy to buy things and return things, which I love that they do the returns piece as well, right? Then is the brand manifests that story in what they're trying to tell. And so again, it, for me, it all goes back to what are those deep customer insights and what's the role that your product or your solution or your company plays? FedEx logo, everybody's probably seen this. In the, in the blank space, there's an arrow. In other words, we get it there. Right. That's what they want people to realize. And so what we try to help uh, small businesses understand is don't think about just something visual. Think about the role you play in your customers lives and how you help that and then make sure that your brand and your logo is a manifestation of that. And that graphic can really facilitate that meaning. But again, it's all connected into what what role you play. What business are you really in? Branding needs to represent that just like the product or the service needs to solve that the actual um 
customer experience, the employee experience, all this has to, you know, be in sync with what your brand wants to communicate. Um, because th this, this whole set is what makes the, the brand of a, of a company. Because uh, Amazon could have, you know, from A to Z, but, uh, you know, you never get their products. They don't, they don't accept their, their, their returns. And, and this really uh, creates, a, creates a damage to their brand. So, so having everything aligned, um, making sure the, the, the touch points of the customers are seamless and, and all aligned with what you propose uh, to be your brand, you know, your brand's vision. Uh, that that all forms the the brand of the company. I was going to say that's what customer centeredness is. If you can do it, it's hard, right? And that's yeah. why when des people are like, "Well, design thinking is great for digital products, but not for other," things. that's not true. All design thinking does helps you understand the needs, helps you understand the insights, and make sure that whatever it is you put in front of them, right, whatever touch points they are, actually solve the need. And so we've used it for everything from products and services to employee touch points to uh, our website to calls, we've prototyped phone calls, right? You can, you know, instead of changing your IVR, you just say, we're going to send those phone calls to a conference call and you have somebody read through a script as if they were a robot, right? And you can prototype things. And so these things can help you sort of change every element of your business. It's hard to do. It's an easy thing for us to say, to change all of the elements of your business to prototype everything. But that's where you see some of these amazing companies get it much more right than others because they're looking at all of those touch points and interaction. And it all goes back, Mauricio, to that key insight that we've got to deliver. You have, we have everything you want and we'll get it to you as easy as possible for Amazon. It all goes back to that singular clear, clear, clear mission. We've touched on small and medium sized businesses a little bit today, but I guess I just want to fire off a really succinct, quick question, which is essentially what's most important when the smaller and, and medium sized businesses are competing with the big guys, what do they need to do? Yeah, I'll, I'll start on that. So I would say a couple of things. One, the beauty of small and mid, mid sized businesses is they are much more focused on the relationships with their customers and they can have, they often can have deeper relationships. And so as much as they want to leverage technology more and more, and they, they've got these hodgepodge systems of all kinds of glue, glued and duct tape systems together, right? they've got to make sure to purpose those and building that relationship. Because oftentimes the reason a customer goes to them instead of one of the big guys is that relationship. And so as much as they want technology to make it easier on them, right? So that they can scale more, et cetera, they are, they are relationship driven and they've got to stay connected to that. And I think that's the thing that they can leverage more than the big guys. What we as providers to them need to do though is we need to work with that crazy hodgepodge system and work with parts of it so that it makes it easier on them so that they can spend their time building those relationships, not running payroll, doing the books, whatever those other businessy sort of things are. They're in the business of making cupcakes. Let's let them make cupcakes more and be out in the front of their small business talking about the cupcakes with their customers. No, I, I mean, I would I would just add uh, the flexibility component, which which is uh, very in line with with Scott uh, mentioned. So, so comparing you know big big businesses with smaller ones, you know smaller ones have the speed and the flexibility needed to uh, to interact and grow their, their their business with with new customers. So the, I guess the challenge is you know how how do you keep that uh, once you grow. You know, I, I think that's that's the biggest challenge for for smaller companies. Perfect. Thank you so much for both of you for joining our audience today. Scott, uh, a big thank you to you, sir. And Mauricio, always a pleasure to have you on, on the show. Thanks, okay. Paul. Appreciate it. Listeners, there you have it. Through the knowledge of Scott and Mauricio, we have gone on quite the design thinking journey today. From starting off by setting the current design thinking context and looking at the evolution of DT, to some of the tools involved in the methodology. But suppose you'd like a little bit more conversation like this. I remind you that our episodes are available in video format via YouTube and on the more traditional audio means via Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. But as ever, if you'd like additional material on what's being covered on today's episode, why not take a look at some of the content we've left you in the description. Finally, we'd love to hear from you. Which of our conversations have you most enjoyed? 
And what are some of the topics you'd love us to cover? Do let us know in the comments section. But for now, as always, thanks for joining us and keep innovating. Thank you.